Hi, I'm Karen. Welcome to the Libro FM podcast, where we talk to authors, narrators, booksellers, and more. And I'm Craig. On today's episode, we had the absolute pleasure of chatting with author TJ Clune, author of t- over 20 books, including The House in the Cerulean Sea, Under the Whispering Door, and most recently, In the Lives of Puppets, which comes out at the end of this month on April 25th. I am so excited for release day for this podcast. We've been dying for you all to hear this episode. We had such a good time meeting TJ. Um, and trust me, the lightning round questions at the end, including Instagram story time, are very much worth sticking around for. Uh, he had some fantastic answers to those questions. <laughs> yes, this episode was super fun. Um, I agree the lightning round is quickly becoming one of my favorite segments of this podcast. I feel like we talked about like very silly stuff, including like him showing us his three foot scissors and how excited he was about those. And, uh, but we also got into some serious stuff too. And um, not to throw someone under the bus, but I believe tears were shed. I don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) Was it you? I've never cried on this podcast (laughs) ever. Oh, this is a lot of lies this early in the podcast, Karen. (laughs) So I'm going to play a clip from TJ's newest book. So you can hear a little bit of that before the interview starts. Just a reminder that you can use the promo code Libro Podcast and you can get two books when you sign up for a membership. If you're not subscribed to the podcast yet, we would love if you did so. And if you are subscribed, please give it a rating if you're so inclined. And with that, we will get into the clip. In an old and lonely forest, far away from almost everything sat a curious dwelling. At the base of a grove of massive trees was a small square building made of brick overtaken by ivy and moss. Who it belonged to was anyone's guess, but from the looks of it, it had been abandoned long ago. It wasn't until a man named Giovanni Lawson, who wasn't actually a man at all, came across it while making his way through the forest that it was remembered with any purpose. He stood in front of his strange find, listening as the birds sang in the branches high above. What's this? he asked. Where did you come from? He went inside, passing carefully through the door hanging off its hinges. The windows were shattered. Grass and weeds grew up through the warped wooden floor. The roof had partially collapsed, and the sun shone through on a pile of leaves that almost reached the ceiling. At the top of the leaf pile, a golden flower had bloomed, stretching toward the sunlight streaming through the exposed rafters. It's perfect, he said aloud, although he was very much alone. Yes, this will do just fine. How strange, how wonderful. Welcome to the podcast, TJ. Craig and I are so happy that you're here with us today. Thank you for sitting down on a Friday morning <laughs> to talk to us. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I greatly appreciate being here. How's your How's your week been going so far here? It has been very um, quiet. The past couple of weeks, I have taken a step away from all writing, all editing, emails and stuff. And it's just to, for me to recharge because, you know, I love I love everything that's happened in the last few years. But at the same time, I'm like, okay, I also need time for me to not <laughs> be public. <laughs> so <laughs> like I, I love going out into the world and talking to people, especially after not doing it in the pandemic. But sometimes I'm like, okay, I'm I'm an introvert for a reason. I need to be at home in my house where I feel safe and protected. Yeah. Yep. Well, sorry to ruin your rest and relaxation <laughs> immediately. That's okay. I, I, yeah. When I do stuff like this, I always, I always have to psych myself up for it, like beforehand. Even though I'm an old hat at all of this stuff now, I'm like, okay, I got to make sure I don't say anything stupid. <laughs> make sure that everybody understands my words. So yeah. yeah. Cool. Luckily for me, I, I also edit the podcast, so I just edit out all the stupid stuff I say. It's great. <laughs> It's good to have that power. <laughs> well, maybe not all of it. I mean, that's part yeah. of my charm is I can be stupid sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Well, TJ, I'm sure almost all of our listeners are very familiar with your work, but um, to kick things off, we'd love for you to introduce yourself. Um, anything that you would like people to know about who you are? Yeah. 
I am TJ Klune. I am the author of many books. At the last count, I think it was 30 plus now. I've been going since 2011. And um, in 2016, I decided, hey, what the hell? Let me quit the safety and security of my full-time insurance job that I'd been at for a decade that had a salary and benefits to go into the wide, wonderful world of, of writing as my job. And I made that decision when I got the biggest compliment that also is an insult in my life from my boss at the insurance company where I worked when he told me one day, you are very good at insurance. <laughs> and if someone tells you that, even in the, even in the, with respect to the job you're doing, it is soul crushing. <laughs> <It's Yeah. laughs> like, this is what my life is. It's like, we're supposed to be good at insurance. <laughs> I mean, somebody has to be, I guess, but yeah. man, when I heard that, I was like, wow, wow. Okay. <laughs> this is what it feels like to be stabbed in the imagination. That person probably thought they were being so nice and it was like, they were. The death and, and it was, it was a compliment and I managed to stutter through. Oh, oh, thank you. But in my head, I'm thinking, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> Have you ever talked to this person like post doing writing full time to like let them know that that was the no, catalyst? But I, I will say that there was, I found out from some former coworkers that there was a bet going on how long I'd last before I'd come back to the job. <laughs> and that was seven years ago. <laughs> so, awesome. Yeah. And my last day was in February of 2016 and I haven't looked back since. Nice. Congratulations. And we're thank you. All of your all of your fans, aka us on this call. We're yes. we're very glad that you stepped away. We're like, write us, write us more things, DJ. I like books more than insurance for sure. Right. <laughs> and then it it, you know, I, I did my whole indie thing like I'd been doing for a little while. Um and in 2017 and 18, I wanted to do something a little bit different. Um, the world, as you guys might imagine, was in a very weird place during that time, politically, economically, socially. And I thought, okay, I want to put out, I want to write a book that reminds people that there's still good in the world, that there's still kindness and hope. And that book turned into The House in the Cerulean Sea. And that book sold to Macmillan and Tor. And then they also bought my young adult trilogy, The Extraordinaries. And I haven't looked back since. This is this is me being able to do what I love every single day. And I am so eternally grateful for it. I love that trilogy. Thank you for writing it. Yay. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I love The Extraordinaries, man. I yeah, love them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so congratulations on the new book coming out April 25th. Um, yeah, that's getting close. How are you feeling now that we're getting so close to the release date? So anytime a book comes out, it always feels like the first time, you know, it's, it's scary. It's wonderful. It's, it's exciting, but this one is, is even more so I think uh, it's scary because this is a book that isn't the house in the cerulean sea this is a book that is not the the under the whispering door my last novel that came out this book those book have been rightly described as cozy fantasies and in the lives of puppets i wanted to merge my lighter writing and my darker writing because i don't always write happy fluffy queer people finding love and success and hope and joy and and i am also known to write some pretty hardcore, darker works. And I wanted to find a way to combine those two sides of my writing in, in the lives of puppets. So when you, when in the lives of puppets opens, it's like the ending of under the whispering door or house in this Cerulean sea. You have these people who are already happy, who are already safe, who are already whole, who already have a home. And then I take that away from them. And that is just, that's the catalyst of this adventure that I give you the cozy, but then I tell you that, you know what? Sometimes that's not enough. Sometimes you have to go out into the world to fight for your future. That's so beautiful. I, I love that you said that too, because um, when Craig and I started reading this, we were very grateful um, to get a, an advanced copy to prepare for this. And we started immediately and we're like, this is different. This is so different. I love it. <laughs> this is great. I wasn't expecting this um, pretty much. Yeah. Right off the bat. <laughs> Yeah, it was, you know, I knew going into this book that, that, that this In the Lives of Puppets itself is a, is a 
queer reimagining, retelling of Carlo Collodi's The Adventures of Pinocchio, but instead of puppetry, it involves machines and androids and artificial intelligence. And at the same time, I wanted to pull from so many different parts of the science fiction and fantasy genre. This, I, this is me essentially lifting my favorite things of this genre and mashing it into, into one book. This is, this is the adventures of Pinocchio. This is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. This is one of the most traumatizing animated movies ever made, Brave Little Toaster. Oh. And if you've seen that movie, The Brave Little Toaster, you know that it looks like this cute, happy little animated film, but it traumatized an entire generation <laughs> yeah. of children yes. Yes, because <laughs> of to me at least because of the character lampy and if it, lampy is a lamp with a light bulb that keeps him alive and guess what sorry to spoil like a 30 year old animated <laughs> film at one point in the movie that light bulb breaks and it looks like lampy dies and you're like holy crap <laughs> and yeah. i just i kept thinking about all the different things about science fiction and fantasy that that bring me joy and it's yes there's happiness and yes there's triumph and yes there's success but even in the original uh, the adventures of pinocchio by Collodi, it is dark it is a dark fairy tale as so many fairy tales actually are we are so used to the disney-fied version of these fairy tales where everybody gets to be happy and everything is wonderful you know so many of us know that the little mermaid was written by hans christian Andersen as a queer love letter to a man that he could never be with the adventures of pinocchio the original version of that story had pinocchio getting murdered and hung from a tree his editor came in Collodi's editor and said you're writing this story for children so you probably shouldn't kill off the child character. <laughs> so he changed it he changed it to the ending that we know of the story now and i just i find that fascinating that there's this duality that that we want to shine off the rough edges, shine off the darkness, and we can only present the happiness when sometimes darkness is necessary to show the lengths that we go to to protect the ones that we love. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what else to say. I was just no. like taking that all in. Thank you yeah. for sharing that. Um, I, I obviously completely agree. And it, it became immediately clear that this was not like the other ones. That there obviously was like, very much your writing style but it was like i was like oh this isn't this isn't just for kids like not the cerulean sea was like i mean every adult i know also <laughs> enjoyed that book right but it was like you have a book you could totally read with your kids mm -hmm. this one became inherently clear that i was like oh this isn't exactly like that the robots were kind of like swearing a little bit and like <laughs> it's it's a little bit more adult and i'm absolutely loving it well what i what i thought about that is you know house in the cerulean sea came out in 2020 I wrote all the Under the Whispering Door, House in the Cerulean Sea, and In the Lives of Puppets almost back to back to back. So In the Lives of Puppets has been done since 2019, 2020, and it's just coming out now. But these stories are connected, not by universe or characters or world, but in, in ideas of theme. And with House in the Cerulean Sea, we had kindness to others and under the whispering door we had kindness to yourself which i think is so much harder to do and then in under the or in, in the lives of puppets we have kindness to people who actively might not deserve it who have done something so terrible that forgiveness might even be out of the question and i thought about the growth of my readers aging yeah so younger readers who may have started in the house in the Australian sea in 2020 have now read Under the Whispering Door in 2021. And now these readers are older in 2023. And I'm hoping that they can grow with that and yeah. accept yeah. this kind of book too, because I want that growth in my writing and I want that growth in my readership. Yep. Yeah. I, I love when series do that. I, I grew up on certain series that, you know, the first book was much more childish. And then as the series went on, it kind of grew with me. And that mm -hmm. was always something I, I loved. So you actually just kind of answered one of my questions that I was going to ask way later. Um, so I'm just going to get into it now for a second. And I'm a little sad. I had this idea <laughs> when we were talking and we we're looking at all the covers and I was looking at Cerulean and Whispering and Puppets next to each other. And I was like, they kind of look like a set. I wonder if they take place in the the TJ Cluniverse. Mm -hmm. And then I think you just said that they don't, which I'm a little... Well, 
it's it's weird because there are are hints in like under the whispering door about the house in the Australian Sea. Yeah, there are a couple of Easter eggs for eagle-eyed viewers in in the lives of puppets, and that's something that I've I've always done with my writing is just for my readers, you know, my long term readers to see. Oh, that's what that. Oh, okay, this mm-hmm. and this and this, but. If any of the stories were connected, I think it would be the first two, Cerulean Sea and and uh, Under the Whispering Door. Because in my head, all I want to see is Chauncey alive and well, crossing <laughs> paths with somebody like Wallace. Yes. And what would that look like? But In the Lives of Puppets is, even if it would be set in the same universe, it would make me sad to think that that's the same universe because this is technically a post-apocalyptic book. That's what we were saying, too, is that, like, is this the post-apocalyptic end of the Cerulean Sea? And that was a little sad, too. Do you know how many readers would literally want to come find me if I was like, (laughs) okay, well, I'm just going to kill off Lucy now. That's cool. (laughs) Linus Baker is dead now. Sorry. Yeah, Yeah, he's dead. No, everything that you love, the island, it's a wasteland. Nothing is good. No, I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. I just, I love the idea that Maybe these worlds are not in the same world, but maybe they're not so far away from each other. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of the book covers as well, um, I they're so fascinating to me because your books are so character driven and there mm-hmm. are just so many beautiful, colorful, exciting, creative people in them. P- people, I guess, is a, a bit of a misnomer. Robots, right. all, all manner of individuals. <laughs> Um, and the covers are so place oriented and mm-hmm. they feel, they have that dreamlike quality to me. Like I was so excited, um, when I finally saw the cover of in the lives of puppets and I'm like, that's how I pictured their home up in the <laughs> trees. And, um, it, Chris Sickles, who does, who's done Cerulean Sea under the whispering door puppets. He's also done all four of the upcoming re-release of the Green Creek series that comes out, starts this summer. Um, he is a singular talent that I am absolutely blown away by i have never met somebody who does art like he does i mean everything you see on my covers um for those books is hand built 3d sets i have oh, the wow. i have the tea shop for under the whispering door sitting in my living room oh my god because he sent that to me and when you press a little button on the side the top floor where the door is lights up with oh my god light up on the inside <laughs> he builds all of these things by hand and then photographs them for the the covers. That's and incredible. I have, uh, if you go wow. to uh, my Instagram, I have posted a couple of fly through that he, fly throughs that he does of the sets wow. um, that show how the books are made. But with those books, to get to your your question, the house, the tea shop, and the tree houses, I wanted those all on the cover because those are characters unto themselves. If you'll notice in this in this group of books, we never have a character on the cover because I wanted the the setting to be a character. Cerulean Sea, the island, the house, that is the setting for the novel, and it feels like a real lived in character. For Under the Whispering Door, ninety five percent of the book takes place inside this one singular location, the tea shop. So it had to feel real, lived in. It had to feel yeah. huge, even though it was a small tea shop with. In the lives of puppets, there's the the tree house, there's the ground house. My favorite detail about the In the Lives of Puppets cover is the chair tipped over outside in the front because it hints at something happened. Was this before Geo arrived as the novel opens, or is this after? Did something happen after? And I love that the mystery that that opens with. That's so wonderful to have more context for, and you know you you were very successful at making these places loved characters because I felt a complete sense of loss and despair when you already said this, so I'm not spoiling anything, but when home is taken away and in Mm -hmm. the lives of puppets, I I think I audibly, I was gasping out loud like, no. (laughs) Yeah. It was, it, it felt, you know, I'm not going to spoil how, what happens because it's the catalyst for their great grand journey that they go on. But it felt important, not only in context with this story, but in context with my previous stories too, with, with House in the Australian Sea and Under the Whispering Door, because those places, the house, the tea shop were places of safety, were places of warmth. What does that look like when that's gone? What do you do? 
you start again from the beginning. And that's what they do in this book. Ugh. So good. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've also been like, um, if you keep seeing me look to my left, I'm looking at the covers as you're speaking and it's, mm -hmm. it's, they're so good. I love them. And they are. He, Chris Sickles, Red Nose Studios, look him up on Instagram. You should see all of his artwork. He is just, he is phenomenal. And I will continue working with him for as long as he'll have me. That's awesome. I can't wait to see those, um, the models and also the, those, I think you posted some animations of the, the Green Creek things and there was like so beautiful i sent it to karen yesterday i was like you have yeah. to see this yeah and they're they're just yeah they're so yeah. good <laughs> so pivoting away from artwork i wanted to talk about audiobooks which surprise, surprise. um this is the libra <laughs> fm podcast yeah. um, so one thing i loved about cerulean sea is when i was reading and listening to it the the first time around everyone i knew was also kind of doing that at the same time and we were all do, listening to it and talking about how good the audiobook was um, the narrator, Daniel Henning just did so many voices and it was just like so immersive and enjoyable. I actually almost enjoyed it better than just reading it in my own head. Mm -hmm. and Absolutely. I was curious how involved in that kind of process were you in terms of like how the characters were going to be voiced and the, the kind of, cause it was very like, they were, it was very strong. Um, it's and very just, theatrical. Yeah. It, it's, yeah. So Daniel, um, is, uh, has a significant theater background. He is an actor. He's a director. He has been on television. He's been in movies. He's been all over the place. And <laughs> what I love is that he also audio narrates textbooks. And I just find that absolutely <laughs> fascinating, or rather he used to. I don't know if he does so many anymore, but I just find that fascinating. Yeah. So I, coming up to tour, what kind of felt like going from the minors to the majors. You get called up, oh, look at me, a queer person making a baseball reference. Yes, <laughs> take that, toss masculinity. All right. So, sorry. So um, I, I was out of my depth. I did not know what I could or could not do. I did not know if I had any say in anything at mm. all. Um, so when it came time to do the narration, I was like, can I, can I suggest narrators or do I, am I going to be like, you know, TJ, shut up, just go <laughs> be your little writer person. And, um, thankfully, uh, Macmillan audio reached out to me first and said, um, Hey, we want to start thinking about, uh, audio for Cerulean. I have this guy. And I think he would be perfect for this. We haven't sent out any auditions um, because I want I want you to hear him. Mm -hmm. And it was Daniel Henning. And I listened to his his audition, and it, his Chauncey voice immediately sold me. It was Chauncey. <laughs> Chauncey's my favorite character in that book. Me too. <laughs> and yeah, well, and um, it sold me at that moment in time. How I work with my narrators, speaking of, of Michael Leslie, who does my extraordinary series, I've worked with him for years. Kirk Graves, who did Under the Whispering Door, who is doing, who did the Green Creek series, who is doing the re-release of my of the Bones Beneath My Skin that Tor is putting out too. I've worked with him for years. I know them. I I don't give any feedback. I say, I trust you, go out into the do whatever you want with these characters. With Daniel. I didn't have that trust that because I didn't have never worked with him before. So I made a decision. I said, okay, are you going to spoon feed him everything that you want? Or are you going to trust him like you've done with the other narrators? So I said, okay, do what you want to do with the book. These, these are my characters, but they're also becoming yours because you are the one giving voice to them. I did not give him any feedback on what he wow. did. On That's it. amazing. He is also doing the narration for In the Lives of Puppets. Now, there were auditions for that between my narrators. The mm, reason Kurt, or the reason that Daniel was picked was because of his voice for Nurse Ratchet. He nailed that. He sounded exactly how I pictured her in my head. And for those not in the know, Nurse Ratchet is a sociopathic nursing machine. <laughs> that acts as one half of Victor, the main character's conscience. He's, she's basically the Jiminy Cricket or the talking cricket of, of this book. And she is a kind-hearted sociopath who yep. loves <laughs> murder and, and <laughs> death and destruction, but also loves her people, her, her, her group, her family. And it was that voice that he did that I was like, sold, done. I didn't, awesome. I was perfect for me. Sometimes it just, it's that easy. To, to have somebody click like that because 
Nurse Ratched and Rambo aren't just side characters. They are on almost every single page. They are yeah. main characters in this book, along with Victor and Hap and Giovanni. And so they need to feel real to the point of, but not to the point of, of, of sounding like too much, because again, you can imagine a character like Nurse Ratched being voiced poorly and yeah. then having you to listen to that through the entire book. <laughs> or Rambo, if 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 you go a little bit too um twee for him, that could become insufferable when yep. you're listening to the entire book. But thankfully, Daniel is just a master of what he does. He's just a remarkable, remarkable performer and human being. Oh, I cannot wait to listen to this. And I will say, TJ. I have been doing a nurse ratchet voice like the last week as I've been, as I've been, uh, are you trying to audition right now, Karen? I'm, I'm <laughs> it's too late. Good. It's too late. Let's, let's hear your nurse ratchet voice. Go. <laughs> Let the drilling sequence commence. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty good. That was pretty good. I'm no I actually Daniel, just got but... to listen to, um, I don't listen to the whole book because it kind of weirds me out to hear my own writing being read <laughs> back to me. But I, I actually just received the the files for In the Lives of Puppets audio. And I, I listen to certain sections and I'm just so giddy at what is coming for this book. That's really I also got the link to the files and I listened yeah. to a little bit of, yeah, I know. They sent <laughs> yeah. it to us a little early, I think, to yeah. prep for this. Yeah. I think we got it like yesterday and I was yeah. I listened to a little bit too and I was like, Oh my God, I can't wait to listen to this. <laughs> it's so good. Yeah. It's so good. It's really good. You're not the first author that said that to us that um listening to the audiobook of their novel is like a, a pretty intense moment. And we've talked to a couple of people who have said, I haven't listened to it at all and I don't plan to. Um, what is it a, about that that uh, hearing it read back to you that makes you wanna listen in pieces? <laughs> so this this is um this is by no means trying to say that I am famous in any way, shape, or form. So please don't take this example as me trying to say that. But <laughs> I liken it to the fact when actors say they can't watch themselves in film or TV. They can't watch their own movies, their own TV show, because all they do is start picking out all the mistakes. They start picking at it. They start trying to say, I wish I'd done this. I wish I'd done that. Oh, why did I write it like this? That is part of it. But also... There's just something very surreal about hearing somebody else reading my own thoughts back to me. And it's it's very strange to hear that, to, to make it even, to go one step further, some of my books are decidedly adult. Like the Green Creek series that, that's coming out, they have sex scenes. And I don't know if you've ever had to edit your own sex scenes. <laughs> I don't know if you've had to listen to a narrator record the filth that you wrote <laughs> and then have to say, okay, this is <laughs> because A, I'm asexual, so it does nothing for me. And B, <laughs> I'm sitting there going, I'm disgusting. <laughs> what is this? Why did I write that? Who taught me these words? Oh <laughs> so it's 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 kind of like that. Like I have. To, to put out the next Wolf Song, the first book in the Green Creek series, my, my tour wanted to do like a just like a refresh edit to look through it. And one of the edits was on a sex scene in that book and was talking about, well, I don't think this character's appendage would be here. And I'm like, oh, God, kill me. Kill me <laughs> now, please. Worst conference call ever. It's so bad, <laughs> you know, and everybody's being like super professional because that's what it is. It's just writing and it's just words, but I'm like covered in flop sweat and like <laughs> wanting to sink lower in my seat to try to escape. So yeah. that's kind of a, a reason. I just, I can't listen to my own stuff read back to me because it's like somebody's in my head reading my mind. That's for Thank you for sharing that. I've, I've always wondered about that and uh, uh -huh. it makes perfect sense. Just, it just like, Somebody tell me when it's over. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I do. And now I'm so I'm so happy to be because when I was indie published or self publishing, I have to review all of that stuff. So with coming up with like Tor and McMillan, there's people that are paid to do that, and I don't yeah. have to worry about it. That's totally fine with me. Quick audio follow up before we move to the the next question. Um, have you ever considered narrating anything yourself, like any of your own books? <laughs> <laughs> I'll take I'll take that as a no. <laughs> no, man. No. Uh-uh. So I I um 
I have ADHD and I tend to talk really fast. And mm. I just know that the the audio engineer that would be the one overseeing my recording sessions would just be would just be quit. He would quit. <laughs> I would force that person whose lifelong dream was to record audiobooks and he'd I would go into he'd go into insurance. He would. You know? He would yeah. go into insurance. He would abs- <laughs> I would drive him into the arms of that damn lizard again. And it would just God, it's just it's terrifying. It's terrifying. Yeah. No, I would never I would never read one of my own audiobooks because or one of my own books because um no 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 shame no no shame to anybody who does but that just feels like to me like look here's more of me <laughs> don't you love me there's a difference i think between like memoirs and recording your own memoir because i think yeah. if i ever wrote a memoir that would be weird to have somebody else read it yeah but when you're like writing fiction and then the an author reads their own fiction i'm like I like having the separation. I like having this. I write. That's my job. I'm a writer. Kudos to people who wear many hats. I just can't do that. I just yeah. can't do it. Well, speaking of wearing many hats, um, you kind of mentioned this at the beginning. Um, this is a question as a fellow introvert. I see that you have your first ever UK tour coming up yeah. for In the Lives of Puppets. How mm-hmm. are you feeling about that? What do you What do you think that journey is going to be like? Well, I have been I have been to the UK for book stuff before. In 2016, uh, we went there uh, all over the UK for three weeks on a book trip slash road trip. And um, I've also been to uh, uh, Germany and 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 Amsterdam doing book stuff there. But they were it was all very indie stuff. It was you know here's a small you know convention of queer readers who are coming to read books. This is like, you know, the first big thing in in the UK that's, you know, an actual tour. And I'm excited about stuff like that. I love I love doing stuff like that, but it's also something that I have to psych myself up for. I have to put on my public face. I have to put on, you know, I'm not saying that my my persona outwardly and in my home life is different. It's just I have to be more than I normally am. So it's a lot of it's kind of like why I'm not working, you know, these past couple of weeks, I've just kind of been taking it easy because I'm kind of psyching myself up because yeah. in April and May, I'm going to be traveling all over the world yep. for, for book stuff. And, you know, I'm so grateful at the opportunities for stuff like that. And at the same time, I'm like, but I'm not a people person. <laughs> <laughs> why do these people want to come and see me blab? <laughs> um, In addition to like that tour and all that, like what is like as someone that's not a writer, the process of like the past few months getting ready for release day, like what goes into that? What are like, what's been on your, your docket of things to do to, to get ready for the book to come out? A lot of marketing stuff. I do a lot of, I've written a lot of blog posts that have yet to go up. I've written, I have all these Instagram posts that I need to do. I have, um, playlists that I need to write for for each book because I love doing that. I love attaching music to books I, I mean these house in the Cerulean Sea and in the lives of puppets are very musical because there's music in the books yeah but um I have to uh uh you know go through and make sure that that everything that I need to get done is done by a certain date because if I don't get it done by then it won't get done because I, <laughs> I won't have time to do anything anymore. It's just, it's a lot of busy work that um, is necessary in order yeah. to be able to, to promote your book. You know, a lot of people think being an author is just that writing. No, <laughs> it's so <laughs> much more. There's marketing, there's editing, there is, there is being social, there is being online, there's all that kind of stuff. And it can be very taxing if if you're not prepared for it. But but you know, thankfully I've I've found a system that works for me. Awesome. Yeah. Um, our next question is I I've I feel like a lot of your characters, um, in in I'll just use the three books that we've been talking about mm-hmm. most, um, the, the three most recent ones, have this real kind of like humble wisdom to them. They talk about these big weighty concepts like um, you know, like love and life and acceptance and all these things, but in very like easy to digest, like simple ways, not simple. And like, I don't mean that in like a demeaning way, but in like a very easy to understand way. Yeah. So I, let me, but before you finish your question, let me tell you a quick side story. Once sure. I was doing a benefit in Seattle 
for like this big hoity toity book <laughs> thing. Like I was so out of place. You have no idea. Cause these are all like rich people, rich, you know, authors that, that are very literary. And <laughs> one author came up to me <clears throat> and he brought a friend with a, a, a colleague or something. And he goes, I wanted to introduce you to TJ Klune. He's very popular. He has a workman like prose. <laughs> oh my like, God. Holy shit. <laughs> well, you want to damn me with faint praise, or you just want to <laughs> backhand me in addition to the backhanded compliment. Seriously. <laughs> so wow. when when I hear when I hear and I'm not saying that your question was going that direction, but I, I'm saying God, I yes. hope not. <laughs> no, no, no. I what I what I think is funny is that people think that big ideas have to use big words and right. and you have to you have to basically be a human thesaurus in order to be able to get your point across. Yep. What the hell man? That's yeah. not how it works. That's not exactly. how it works. When I'm writing, if I'm writing in in you know concepts simplifying them, it's not because I don't trust my readers to be able to grasp these concepts. I'm trying to make sure that these books are accessible to everyone, you know? And I want to have big weighty ideas but you can't just thrust somebody into that big weighty idea. You need to work up to it by grounding it in reality, even in the face of the fantastical. I'm so sorry I interrupted your question. No, I just no honestly, my, I mean, you... the, the phrase workman's like prose has always stuck with me there because I'm <laughs> yeah. like, you know what? I'm going to take that as a compliment from this point on. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I think you, you kind of just answered the question a little bit anyway, honestly. What I was going to say was just that it, you say these big weighty things in, in in kind of simple ways that are digestible and accessible to everyone, even whether they're young readers or people that just don't read the big philosophical books. Or and people just... who read English as a second language. Totally. Yeah. Or yeah. third or fourth language. Yeah. I have so many international readers. Thankfully, they're starting to get their own translated versions, you know, into there. Yeah. I mean, How Since Resiliency has been translated into over 30 languages so far. But what I love about this, you know, I get I get emails from international readers who don't have the version of of their translated version quite yet, and they want to read this book. So when they read it, they may not be able to get every single little thing because English isn't their first language, but they're able to understand the big, huge ideas that I'm going for because I, I'm trying to make it as accessible as possible because I know there are younger readers. I know there are older readers. I know I have readers of every single age. And I just want to make sure that A, I'm not being condescending. I'm not talking down to people, but I'm also making sure that I'm not whitewashing my own ideas. You know, I'm right. not trying to dilute myself in order to get the point across. Yeah. I just, I just, I don't think that big, huge universal ideas need to be ensconced in language that is inaccessible. I think it needs to be accessible to all because the pursuit of knowledge is an extraordinary privilege. And I think that that we need to make that as, as accessible for as many people as possible. Yep. I, I um, have spent a lot of time in the poetry world and I've experienced so much of what you're talking about in terms of people thinking that accessible is too simple or thinking that it has to be completely tangled and, you know, you have to spend hours thinking about it to unwind it. And um, yeah, I've, I've come across that conversation a lot as well. Well, see, it, it gets to the point. I, I love the idea that books can just be books to the people who want them to be books to other people. They can mean more, but not everything in a book has to have meaning. Not every, not, not every decision I make or, placement i put the characters i mean there there is people debating nelson's chair in under the whispering door and what that's supposed to symbolize i'm like it's just a freaking chair he's just <laughs> sitting in a chair <laughs> that's all it is you know people are you can you can read into anything i've written how it wants but sometimes things are simple just because they're simple that's all it is well, the last um, question we wanted to ask you before we move on to our lightning round, which yeah. we will <laughs> tell awesome. you about shortly. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of my favorite things about your work, of which there are many, but um, I just love your celebration of otherness. Um, mm -hmm. And I've I've heard you talk about this on um, other interviews and podcasts as well in terms of um, making sure that otherness, queerness, et cetera, is represented as fully as possible and not just, you know, kind of how it's how these things are commonly understood in the in the day to day, um, and you know you talked about the journey as well across your books in terms of love of others, love of self, 
forgiveness as an act of love. Um, can you talk a little bit more just about the the journey of how you celebrated otherness in your works and, and why this is so important to you as a writer? Yeah. So <clears throat> when I was a kid, I grew up in, uh, I was born and raised in rural Oregon um, in the 90s. Or I was born in the 80s, but I came of age in the 90s. So you can imagine how that would be. I came, I, I was born in a time when AIDS and HIV was decimating my community. I grew up in a time when Reagan ignored the cries from uh, the queer community for help. I lived in a time, I came of age and un understood my own queerness in a time when don't ask, don't tell passed by Clinton. And um, when you're a kid with undiagnosed ADHD, when you're a queer kid who, who's understanding what it means to be queer, it creates this sense of otherness in you because it, it makes you feel like you can't relate to your peers. And, and, and building those kinds of connections, especially when you're young, is important because it helps with your growth. That helps with your socialization. It helps with your, 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 your empathy. And I remember being in sixth grade and sitting in music class and I sat with my legs crossed. Like my my one knee on top of my other knee, my foot hanging down. And I looked over, I remember, and the music teacher was making fun of me for how I was sitting. And because it was effeminate, because I was an effeminate kid. I was a fet as a child. And that was the first time I think I'd really seen out and out bigotry in that kind of form. Granted, I got to experience a whole lot more after that of, of, yeah. of bigoted people and lives. My own family made fun of me for reading. My own family made fun of me for writing. My own family hated the fact that I was queer. My own family wouldn't take me to go to a doctor to get diagnosed with ADHD that I so clearly had. So when I talk about otherness, when I write about otherness as something to be celebrated rather than denigrated. It's becoming from a very personal place. I know how it feels to be 13, 14, 15 years old and feel like everyone is attacking you for simply existing. I find it very chilling that we are now in 2023 and the, the rise of anti-LGBTQ, specifically the rise of anti-trans legislation that this country is seeing and passing, not only for gender affirming care for minors under the care of their parents and their doctors. But now there's legislation that's trying to work its way through that would prohibit trans care for anyone, for anyone of all ages. We are right now in the midst of a war against otherness, against people like us, people like me, who want to see their stories told. What do you say? to a trans kid in a school in Florida, it gets better. That's stupid because it gets better implies that something will happen in the future that will get your life better. Why can't it get better now? Why can't we celebrate you now? And that's what I want to do with my books. I want to show these people, everyone out there, that no matter who you are, no matter if you feel othered or different, no matter if you're queer or trans or non-binary, no matter if you're intersex or neurodiverse or whatever, you are important, you are valid, and no one should be able to take that away from you. No one, ever. And the fact that people are trying, it says a lot more about them than it does our community. And I, I, I often get You'd be surprised at this. I often get people who tell me they don't want to hear me be political. Guess what? I'm a queer person in 2023 in the United States. My entire life is political, not because I've made it political, but because politicians have made my life political. Yeah. So what does that mean for me? Well, that means since you have made my life political, I am going to use my voice. I'm going to talk about these things, and I'm going to make sure everyone damn well knows who hears me speak that these draconian and uh, frankly cruel measures that are passing in the United States right now, I think about 50 years ago in the 1970s when Anita Bryant came forth and said in the state of Florida, homosexuals are indoctrinating our children. We need to start the Save Our Children campaign. And this was in the 70s. She did the exact same thing. She said teachers were indoctrinating students, that books were turning children queer. 
And <clears throat> what 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 does history view her as now? As a bigot, as a ridiculous person who who has who, who was speaking basically gibberish. And yet here we are in 2023 with people doing the same thing she was doing in the 70s. So it makes me think, what are we going to think about these people in 5, 10, 15 years? I already know what I think about them now. Yeah. But what is the world going to think about them? And I don't think people think about that. I don't think that they think about the future because I can guarantee you one thing. In the future, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, we're going to look back at this time and realize that this is the time that the queer community became the more powerful than they have ever been. Because you don't want to know what our agenda is, the gay agenda. The gay agenda is us being able to live free and happily like everybody else. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. And and truly, thank you for creating this space and these worlds for, for others like us and all of your readers. And we just... We're, we're lucky to have you, TJ, and to have your words. Thank you. I'm lucky to have all of you. So <laughs> feeling is mutual. <laughs> awesome. Well, um, I know we don't have a ton of time left. So, Craig, should we move on to our lightning round? <laughs> Coming off of that, um, we're about to ask you a bunch of silly questions now. Yay! Very silly. <laughs> yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll lighten That's good. The, That's a good yeah. way to end these things. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so we've been doing this for the past four or five episodes where we kind of end by asking just kind of like rapid fire, silly questions. You don't need to think about them. Um, so Karen, if you would like to ask the first one. Yes, TJ, my first question for you, if you could hang out with one character from your latest book, who would you choose and why? Rambo, because Rambo <laughs> is uh, basically a vacuum cleaner that is going to make a lot of people cry. And he has the heart and soul of golden retriever. <laughs> yes, that was the only correct answer to that yes. question. Yes, <laughs> and I, I'll give you guys. I want to give you guys a little hint on that too. Each of the characters in, in the lives of puppets is based on a musical performance. Rambo, can you guess what Rambo's might be? I'll give. I'll tell you. For example, the coachman is based on Gerard Way from My Chemical Romance. Oh my the, gosh. the Black Parade. The Black Parade. <laughs> right. Yes. Uh, the Blue Fairy is based on Annie Lennox, and Sweet Dreams Are Made of This. <laughs> Not I will I will say this in the least spoilery way possible. Uh -huh. The the place the blue fairy is in yes. yeah. is so visual and beautiful, and I this needs to be like a movie or something because I need to see this. <laughs> um, well, I hope then I get to announce something very soon. So, oh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is your most favorite and least favorite household chore? Oh my God. Favorite is cleaning kitchen grout oh, God. <laughs> me too I love, it. I love getting down with my little brush and my little spray <laughs> it's, it's literally like, it's like a tooth before this call. it's like this little toothbrush <laughs> thing that you can get and you turn it on and you clean the grout <laughs> yes. and it's the whole thing smells horrible because you're getting dirt <laughs> cleaning up the grout but when you're done and it dries you're like holy crap I'm <laughs> I am like I am like Michelangelo, what is this? Look at my work on this stone. What is this? Did I carve the David statue out of this? And my least favorite chore, as always, is mopping. I hate mm. mopping. And I have to do that when we get done talking today. And I'm so annoyed. Ugh. Oh, no. <laughs> and you have to kind of go backwards so you don't step over the parts yeah. you just cleaned. It's a hole. Yeah, yeah, for real. And, you know, and I'm like, oh, okay. Oh, oops. I accidentally stepped in a part that I already mopped. Now my sock is wet and everything sucks. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is the most memorable trip you've ever taken? To see the oh god, sorry. I went to. I told you. I went to. I told you. I went to Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. um, the next to the, we went to the floating flower garden market there, and that was supposed to be the coolest thing in the world until I saw the history of torture museum right next to it, <laughs> and then I went into the history of torture museum because that sounded amazing. And then I didn't know that it was an interactive history of torture museum where they they want audience participation. Oh no! Oh no! Oh, oh no! Yeah, that was my favorite. <laughs> yeah, I went to one of those two on a trip trip to Europe, and it was very strange. It was like a wax figure is all in various forms of torture. Luckily, I luckily I did not have to participate. This one had all the instruments of torture and everything, and you got to get locked into certain things. And so I, being an introvert, always tried to hide behind everybody else, but they found me. Yep. They always they, <laughs> they always found, do. They, found me. they always yeah. do. Yeah. Um so your house is on fire. 
you have to leave immediately. What are the one or two things you grab on your way out? And living beings do not count. Oh, oh. <laughs> um, two things that I grab. I'm not very stuff oriented. So, oh shit, as I say that, then I'm going to say my PlayStation 5 <laughs> and my my signed first edition copy of The Front Runner by Patricia Nell Warren, which nice. is my, I, I was actually able to get to know Miss Warren before she passed. And um, she is just, that was the first queer book I read as a kid. And granted, it was traumatizing because of how it ends. And if you don't know, I won't spoil it here, but um, it's something I cherish because she is, she was a wonderful woman and and just gave me some of the best writing advice. Um, <laughs> this one is ridiculous. I'm sorry. Go, if go, you go, go. if you pivoted to become a DJ, what would your mm-hmm. DJ name be? <laughs> <laughs> so when I was a kid, my my I go by TJ. My my real name is Travis John Clune. Um, when I was a kid, my family used to call me. <laughs> you can't use this against me my family used to call me um travioli so it would be dj travioli i love that Perfect. so much yeah honestly. that's wonderful yeah all right last uh lightning round question what three words would your best friend use to describe you possibly chaotic evil <laughs> so this is very similar to hap to hap yes. Yeah. yeah yes it is it, it would be um i appear can be very genteel and I can be funny and I can be, you know, conversational, but I can also be vindic- vindictive. <laughs> and, 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 you know, my brain is chaotic evil. That's just what it is. My brain is always moving at a billion miles per hour. So why not put that out in my real life too? <laughs> I love it. Okay. Our last ridiculous moment for you. We've been doing something called Instagram story time, where we look at your Instagram, we find a picture that is compelling and then ask you to tell us what happened. Yeah, um, cool. The picture we found, you're holding a giant pair of scissors and you look so happy. Oh my God. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> hold on. For, for listeners, I think TJ is getting this. Yes. yes the scissors <laughs> are here. <laughs> so I was asked to brand open that sounds weird uh <laughs> barnes and noble that opened up in uh uh about a 30 minutes north of where i live and i told them if i'm going to do this there needs to be a gigantic scissors so i can cut the ribbon <laughs> and so they got the gigantic scissors so i cut the ribbon and then i told them as i was leaving i'm taking these scissors <laughs> and they said okay so i got to keep the giant scissors Because when I was a kid, I always wanted a pair of giant scissors because you always saw on the news, grand opening, or they're doing this or that. And everybody got to look so cool with giant scissors. (laughs) And so for the first time in my life, I got to look cool with giant scissors. And if you thought that I was going to let that moment go to waste (laughs) and not take the giant scissors home with me, you are out of your damn mind. Now, the real question that you should be asking me right now is have I used these giant scissors to cut things? Yes, yes, I have. I have. I have used these in unnecessary ways. Like <laughs> ways that if I'd gotten smaller, normal size scissors would have made the job that much quicker. But because I have a pair of giant oversized scissors that re- requires me to use them, yeah. I tried to use them to prune the hedges too, but that didn't work very well. <laughs> So now these hang in the all these sit in my writing office. So whenever I'm feeling sad, I can look over and be like, you know what? You were once important enough to hold to a pair of giant scissors, scissors to open a Barnes and Noble. I uh, am crying yeah. laughing so much. Yes. <laughs> People will ask me on my deathbed what my what my greatest achievement in my writing career would be. And I will point with a shaking hand. <laughs> this is over there. Have I told you that story before? <laughs> yes, Grandpa, you've told it every day since you've got them. Well, it was about when I was 37. <laughs> I think the PS5 just went down in the ranking of the to grab on the way out the door. Oh, no, it would. Like, had I remembered that my gigantic scissors <laughs> were sitting right there, I would say, screw the PS5, man. This is the only thing I need to make me happy. Think, <laughs> if I went to a desert island, what would be more important? A PS5 or a giant pair of scissors? The giant scissors. The scissors, <laughs> yes. yeah, definitely. Thank you. Yeah. They're multi-useful in multiple ways. Right. I know. I know. Trust me. I have used them in multiple ways. <laughs>
Nobody take that wrong. That's a, that sounded like it could have come out wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, um, very last question for you, TJ. Yeah. Um, before we let you go, um, our listeners always want to know, what are you reading and enjoying right now? I am reading a book that is not out yet. It is by one of my favorite authors that I get the chance to do a uh, her stop on in uh, the States as she's coming over here. And that is Some Desperate Glory by Emily Tesh. And if you don't know Emily Tesh's um, prior, this is her actual first full length novel, but she is known for writing two queer novellas, Silver in the Wood and Drowned Country, which are some of the best atmospheric writing I have ever read. They are extraordinary. This is something completely different. Those are like steeped in folklore and and whatnot. This is a space adventure, and this is <laughs> remarkable. It is such a good book. I'm only about a third of the way through, but I'm so excited for Emily and this book to come out. Uh, well, one of our favorite parts of this podcast is getting great recommendations, and our, our to-be-read list is ever-growing. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for spending so much time with us. I know you have like a million things going on. You have lots yeah, of I marketing know. I to, to do. The floors right now. <laughs> yeah, so true. Thanks. For yeah, that. you thanks. have things to be going to cut, and you know, yeah. so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so thought I just thought of so many things I could cut today. <laughs> <laughs> Watch out, neighbors. Um, well, thank you so much for spending the time with us. This has been so fun, and um, congratulations again. And you know, we hope the tour goes great and everything. So thank you, and and remember, everybody, in the lives of puppets, April twenty fifth, and it will. I will make you cry over a Roomba vacuum cleaner and I do not feel bad about that in the slightest <laughs> well on that on that note uh, thanks again and we'll talk to you soon thank, thank you, you. DJ. bye bye all right thank you so much for listening everyone we hope you enjoyed uh, all of the wisdom and hilarity that TJ had to share with us um, one of the things that I teased at the beginning was that we realized after recording, we didn't get the answer to a very important question from TJ. Craig, would you like to tell the tale of the oh, information sure. we received? <laughs> sure, sure. Um, so as TJ mentioned, each of the characters kind of has like a song associated with them, not in the book, but like in his brain, I guess. Um, and we forgot to ask who Rambo, the vacuum cleaner robot was, like what his song was. And TJ very graciously sent it to us, and it was Baby Shark. <laughs> it was. Which it then was. was in my head for the following three days after receiving that email. So <laughs> thanks, TJ. Appreciate it. When he when he sent us the email to give us this information, it included the video of Baby Shark. And yes. our agreement was that if he provided us with this information, we had to watch the entire song. <laughs> so. Did you watch the entire song? I did, because it was our agreement with TJ. Oh, I broke that agreement. <gasps> I TJ's watched like five seconds this. of it. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> you're in trouble. Now you're going to be the favorite. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> this was your plan all along to call me out on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, Craig, before we sign off, I would love to hear what you're reading right now. Um, a book that I just finished and was obsessed with was um, The Stolen Air uh, by Holly Black which is book four in the Folk of the Air series, which if you're into elves and trolls and nonsense, then this is the book for you. Um, loved it, loved it, loved it. Have you read awesome. any of those? I haven't, but I'm going to now because you've spoken very highly of them. Mm, it's fun. Sold. <laughs> you get to meet Cardin and Jude. You're in for such a treat. I'm, I'm into it. I'll do it. <laughs> yes. Um, what are you reading right now <laughs> my brain stopped working there for a okay? second we need to stop recording these at the end of the day when my brain is fried <laughs> um right now i am reading homebodies by tembe denton hurst and very much enjoying it i am reading this via audiobook and um it's about a black woman in new york who is a high-powered writer in the media she's a beauty writer um she is replaced at her job and it kind of sets her life into a reckoning with um, what she does for her career, what what art is to her, what her relationships mean to her, um, 
even where she lives. Um, and I've, I'm just really enjoying the writing. The narrator, uh, Marcella Cox, is fantastic. Um, highly recommend. I also read that and liked it a lot as well. So good. Did you listen to the audiobook? I did. Yeah. The audio was so good. Yeah. Really good. Really good. Can't um, how far into it are you? I'm about halfway, I would say. Nice. Do you have any favorite characters? I love the main character, Mickey. Yeah. A lot. I also love her girlfriend, Lex. I'm very much enjoying her and their relationship and um, watching how they kind of support each other in times of at-home crisis has been very reminiscent of like the pandemic and yeah. <laughs> all of those things. So love it. Yeah. How excited are you for our next episode? Very. <laughs> I don't know that I am the one to speak to that though, because <laughs> I think this is one of your favorite authors that, that we got to interview. <laughs> yes. Um, I think we teased this at the end of the last episode that we were going to be recording with the Schwab. And now we have done that. Um, so that was really fun for me. So now you believe it's real. It actually happened. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Up until the moment of recording, I was like, eh, it'll probably fall through, but it didn't. And it was awesome. <laughs> yes. So that is coming soon to all of you as is. Yes. The next book in the Darker Shades of Magic series. Yes. So exciting. <laughs> and by soon in like six months and it's killing me. It'll be here before you know it. I like that. I asked for an arc of it before the podcast and the publisher was like, come on. <laughs> like we're not giving you that so the Worth podcast does not have does not have enough sway for that just yet you know <laughs> yeah. well thanks so much for joining us again everyone we'll see you next time with our ve schwab interview and uh as always thanks for listening 